Okay, as we continue with our Christmas special, if you want to call that, should a Christian celebrate Christmas? And what a study we're doing. I'm not going to be pre-review or anything like that. You need to go back and listen to, I believe this is the fifth one. I believe you should go back and read the, and listen to the other four. And I'd like to read to you before we start, 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, spirit of Christmas, and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know, there are just some Christians who won't listen to this study as I deal with people. Forbidding to marry, command, commanding to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Jump down to verse number 6. And if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things which I'm trying to do for you people. This is not the lost, this is to the saved. My brethren. Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereon, whereunto thou hast attended, but refuse profane and old wives' tales, fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable, to, profitable unto all things, having a promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. Trying to help you out. Trying prayerfully to show you what, what is a lie. What is false. And what God does not approve of. That Christians say God does approve. And he doesn't. As we enter part three to this essay. This report. We say it's going to be Christmas. The spiritual violation of the Ten Commandments. In reverse order. So letter A. Do not covet. Is the number 10 commandment. Children learn to covet the gifts of others. To drool over the Christmas catalog. And to drag their parents endlessly through toy stores. All in the name of the Christmas spirit. Thou shalt not covet. What are you teaching your children? Letter B, number nine commandment. Do not bear, or thou shalt not bear, false witness. Jesus is the reason for the season. It is the Christian battle cry to put Christ back in Christmas. I've been hearing that nonsense since I've been saved in 87. When actually there is not only no biblical warrant for Christmas, but its roots are in pagan worship systems. Go back and read and listen to what we've done. Nevertheless, professing Christians lie to their children about Santa Claus. The supernatural, the sorceress, false god of Christmas, whose gospel is one of works. you got to be a good little boy, or Santa won't come and visit you. That's works. Salvation along with unconditional acceptance and rewards. See, if you be a good boy, you'll get rewards. If you're a bad boy, Santa Claus won't come to you. Papa, why don't you just get the rod out and rear up your child instead of blaming Santa Claus? You ain't got enough gumptions to be a father in your family. You had put the discipline to an imaginary God. Parents lied to their children for years about the God-like character of Santa Claus. In effect, asking them to trust in a false God and a lie. And they don't understand why later in life their children won't believe and trust the true God. Who is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is God. You taught them a lie. You've had them believe somebody who's not. 
Number eight, thou shalt not steal. Now he has do not steal. I don't know if it's part of the report or if he's got another Bible, but thou shalt not steal. He said, where is the stealing? Christmas spending parents could never stand the test of biblical stewardship. I.e., Christians in celebrating Christmas steal the Lord's resources by ignoring their proper use. Lavishly spending these resources on worthless and useless trinkets in many cases. And withhold resources from those in need while at the same time claiming to never have enough money to buy good Christian books, pay for homeschooling, or buy Bible helps for their children. You'll send your children off to mama, papa, public school system to raise your little boy and child, but I ain't got the money, I ain't got the time to homeschool. I don't have to worry about my children being shot in the school. My children homeschool, been always homeschooled. My children get the Bibles, they have a Bible. They have their own Bible. Christians could be helping the spiritually needed by buying and giving them tracts and books and etc. We steal from our families what they need and what we owe them in order to buy gifts for those who don't need them. And then, you know, the day after Christmas, you run down the store to exchange that gift that your husband bought you that you really didn't want. And you could get something else which is more, more expensive than what you really don't need that sits in a closet for 30,000 years. And open up the closet and you got very happy moths. Letter D. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And you, where are you going with this one? I can, I can quote a song. I saw Mama kissing Santa. Mama has no business kissing Santa. Last time I checked, Santa had no business kissing no mama. He's married himself, supposedly. At this special time of the year, it is said, lustful thoughts are actually encouraged. E.g., teens are allowed to go to parties and stay out later thereby having temptations put in front of them that otherwise would not be there. Christmas parties for adults also encourage evil thoughts through the use of mistletoe. Remember that? Remember when we talked about the mistletoe? You need to go back if you weren't, you didn't hear that. Or maybe you forgot. According to Matthew chapter 5, such thoughts constitute adultery. At this very, that's 528, I'll give you the verse. At the very least, spiritual adultery is encouraged by the season. You're giving your love instead of to God and Jesus Christ. You're giving it to the tree, the Santa, to presents. Letter E. Do not or thou shalt not murder. Now you, you're really off ball on this one. Envy and hate of my brother, which is according to Matthew chapter 5, is equal to murder. You can find that in 1 John 2. I don't mean 2 as in the chapter. I'm talking about an epistle of 1 John. You can find through the whole entire book about if a man hates his brother, he's a murderer. And he even likens Cain, who murdered his brother. By the way, you know, Cain represent religion. Abel represented the, 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 the man that's under the blood. All right, get back on. Because he has more than me, or because he receives a larger Christmas bonus than me. And is encouraged at Christmas time. Envy is ahead of, of Christmas. You know what time of year people commit more suicides? We also tend to be spiritually sacrificed our children to the God of Christmas. What is the God of Christmas? Greed, self selfishness, etc. F. 
to honor thy father and mother. Christmas gift giving is not an honor to parents. The term exchanging gifts, i.e., giving an expectation of a return, is a dead giveaway of the mockery associated with the tradition. You know what also does not honor mom and dad? It's when mom and dad goes out and works hard all year long and buys the gifts and they put Santa's name on it. And the kids praise and love and kiss Santa for what mom and dad did. That's not honoring your father and mother. You know, in both Old Testament and New Testament, that has a promise attached to it. You know why children are dying early these days? You know why all the violence is happening to children? The Bible says that Paul says, Honor thy father and mother, for it's the first commandment and promise. The, first, the promise is longer life. If you dishonor your father and mother, there is no long life. The wages of sin is death. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth that he shall also reap. Not honoring a father and mother will cause you an early death. And you thought only cigarettes and beer will kill you. G. Now I forget what number we're up to. I'm doing it backwards. Now this one here, before I start, this is the only commandment that Paul says we're not to honor as Christians. Paul will give you a list in the book of Romans of the nine commandments. Ten, the Sabbath, is not for the Christian. Okay, so remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Although we recognize that the Lord's Day is not a Christian Sabbath, clearly the Lord's Day is to be kept for worship and, and deserved as such for God. For the Bible, for preaching and teaching, for fellowship. Yet when Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, or the day after Christmas falls on Sunday, most churches adjust the Lord's Day to accommodate Christmas, usually by canceling a regular scheduled Sunday service, or even doing have the evening service. Heck. Churches today don't have an even service even if it's not a holiday. Most of its members are too busy or too tired to attend services anyway. And to that, I give you a big, um. Uh, and what's that hymn? Tell it to Jesus. Letter H. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Ooh -wee. Christ and Mass are two words that are totally opposite from one another. And to connect the two is blasphemy the name of Christ. By taking the pagan celebration and Christianizing it and calling it the celebration of birth of Christ, it's most certainly taking the Lord's name in vain. A good example of the willingness of the professing church to profane the name of the Lord would be the title of the proper children's Christmas concert production, The Divine Ornament. I don't know. Imagine identifying the Lord with a pageant ornament to hang on a pagan tree. What an insult, what a blasphemy, and that, I have no idea what he's talking about. Thank God. My family don't know what he's talking about. Thank God. My children don't know what he's talking about. Thank God. I may have kicked to God, not even know it. Thank God. In addition, some profession Christians use religion, Christ's birthday, as a cloak to cover the evils of covetousness, idolatry, Greed, immortality, etc. All excuse to give vent to evil lusts and teach your children to lie. Letter I. 
Do not make yourself and carve image. You want me to stop? Nativity scenes. Pictures of Christ. Christmas cards with pictures of Jesus, etc. All violate this command. God has given us his word, not images, to teach us about Christ. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Not seeing, not television, not these movies about the Bible. Turn off the boob tube and get your Bible open. References would be 1 Peter 1.23, Deuteronomy 4.12, Deuteronomy 4.15 through 19, letter J, number 10. Number one, first, number ten on this one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The God of Christmas is idolatrous. And Christian, you cannot say anything otherwise. As Christmas morning, you wake up and you bow down before that tree to receive the gifts. Yes, you do. I've taken part in Christmas a number of years. You bow down to that tree to fill it with water. You bow down to pick up the gift, and you don't acknowledge Jesus Christ, the gift of God. You are a liar if you say you do. You are greed as you open and fly that gift wrapping paper all around. You ain't thinking about Jesus. You are a liar. And do your neighbors know about the about the gift of God? Does your boss, your co-worker, does the cashier at your grocery store know about the gift of God? Looking to this to the Christmas season for happiness, for joy, and fulfillment, and you probably couldn't name the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit, Mr. Christian! Rather than through a pure, personal, biblical relation with Jesus Christ. Anything but that personal, biblical relationship with Jesus Christ is idolatry. Jesus is the reason for the season. What do we talk about in the solstice? That's not Jesus. Part four is Christian. Is it Christian's decision to celebrate Christmas a part of Christian liberty? I've got liberty. You get off my back, brother Hayward. I've got liberty. I'll get off your back. I'm gonna keep on going with this, but I'll get off your back. Once you tell me, oh, I'm going to do my own thing, I'll get off your back. I'll pray, I'll pray against you for you to get right. And the God, the, 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 the burden in your heart, you get right. When you're not enjoying Christmas no more, you better be sure it's me praying. Romans 14, 1 through 13. How many of you are going to go check that out? Letter A, Romans 14, 1 through 13. Most of you won't. This passage is speaking of Jews who were observing the Old Testament Jewish holiday or holy day, feast and dietary laws, even though they were now believers in Christ. But they were also judging the Gentiles, brothers in the Lord, who did not observe the Jewish custom. Gentiles were getting saved by Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah. The Jews were turning to him and saying, Hey! Hey! You ain't doing what the Bible said to do. Likewise, the Gentile Christians were judging their Jewish brothers who were seemingly caught up in the, in the ceremonial law. The Gentiles, hey, you guys, you're, you're in the law. We're not in the law. Get out of it. And the Jews are going to the Gentiles. Hey, you're not in the law. Get in the law. 
Paul said to you Gentile Christians, leave the Jewish Christians alone. Because they are not violating any scriptural commands by their actions. All right? It is not a disputable matter, doubtful or gray area, and not a moral issue. To you Jewish Christians, it's okay for you to observe the Jewish festival and the dietary laws because they were given by God in the Old Testament and thereby are considered to be previously approved worship forms. There is nothing wrong with thou shalt not commit an adultery. Now that I'm a born again Christian, now that I'm saved in the New Testament, I can go sleep with any woman I want, right? No. Thou shalt not steal. Well, now that I'm saved, I can go steal. No. But don't judge your Gentile brothers. Because there is no biblical command for either of you to continue to observe these things. There's a comment here, but we'll, we'll look at it later. He says, actually, it wasn't okay. See, 4C below. But Paul allowed it as an act of an immature, weaker brother as we study in section 2, letter G above. We already saw that one. If a moral issue is involved, a practice that is covered in Scripture, then this passage and the application to Christian liberty, i.e., the freedom to engage in practices not prohibited by Scripture, would obviously not apply. There are things the Bible tells us to do, and there are things the Bible tells us not to do. We are to do what the Bible says. If it says not to do it, you don't do it. If it says for you to do it, then you are to do it. Plain and simple. Third grade elementary school here. Unless you want to be a Christian in 2013. You can't even make it to kindergarten. You can't even make it to, to preschool. Without wetting your pants over something like this. I think it's a rule that no kid can go to school until they've learned to use a potty. And as I deal with Christians like this, they just wet their diapers. And soil themselves. And you don't like this talk. As brought out earlier in this report, the celebration of Christmas appears to be such a moral issue because it's a celebration is not only wait a minute, because it celebration is not only not from God. Let me read that again. Because the celebration is not only not from God, but it is from ancient paganism itself. You cannot find anywhere in the Bible anything. God tells you to do in Christmas. He doesn't tell us to honor birthdays. He doesn't tell us to honor Jesus' birthday. He doesn't tell us about Jesus' birthday, the date. He doesn't tell us to go out and get a tree. Matter of fact, Jeremiah 10 speaks against it. It says it's a pagan thing to go do it. And everything else. We've looked at the holly. We've looked at the candles. Continue on, on the Christian liberty, part B, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 13. 1 Corinthians 8, 4 to 13. I'm going to leave you to look up these yourself. If you're really sincere and want to do right, God will lead you to these scriptures. And the Holy Spirit, if you pray before you open up these scriptures, the Holy Spirit will, will work through you. And in you. And how many of you dare would say the Holy Spirit will lie to you? Anybody care to say that? Christian? I'm not talking to unsaved people. I'm talking to you to have the Holy Spirit in you. 
Would you think the Holy Spirit would lie to you? But you will lie to the Holy Spirit so you can keep these festivities going on. The Gentile Christians who had been raised up in an idolatrous system, especially in Corinth, were having a problem with the Jewish brothers who were eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols. And apparently this was the only healthy meat available. The meat that was not offered to idols you would not want. The best cuts would be offered to Diana and all that. Similar to Romans 14 passage above that we did, Paul says that eating meat that has been sacrificed to idols is not a moral issue. And thereby, therefore, thereby is not prohibited. If that meat was offered to an idol, it's not prohibited. But let's go on. See, it's an issue before we go on to, did you know? After this report, you listening to this, you now know what Christmas is. And you can't say, oh, I can eat and, and divine in Christmas. And not have God judge you. However, Paul does not say that it's okay to go into the pagan temple itself. In fact, in other passages of 1 Corinthians 10.14 and 1 Corinthians 10.18.21, Paul specifically prohibits getting involved with such pagan feasts. Now, he also gives you... Let me read this out. Let me get this out of my head. This case is not here. If it is, he just backs me up. Paul says that if you're sitting down at meat and the guy lays the food out before you, eat, enjoy, bow your head and say, Lord God, I thank you for this meal. But if the guy lays the food at your table and says, Mr. Jones, I offered that to Diana. I offered that the potatoes to Jupiter. I gave this to God, Simeonitis. I gave this to such and such God. Then Paul says you get up from the table and you don't eat. If you are made known that this was offered, then you're not to eat. In other words, as we get back to report, it's not a moral issue to partake in the byproducts of pagan religious systems. Note, however, that there is no indication here that the Jewish Christians were using the idolic meat, the idol meat, as part of their worship. They were using it to eat the meat, to be, you know, to satisfy hunger. But it's not okay to partake in a religious system itself. Because the corrupt character of the participants would be harmful for believers. In other words, if you can go in the market and buy a piece of meat for your family, or you can sit down and have a, have a McDonald's hamburger at a table, and okay, McDonald's is not a, an idol. Well, if he would come up to you and say, hey, we sacrificed this to Baal, you're not to eat. You're not to go into a religious system to partake. You cannot go to a church that's not a Bible-believing church and have a spaghetti meal. How's that one? How about going to a church that's going to have a bazaar to pay for the God's small G-O-D Stuff in their church. No! Imagine someone seeing you shop around in a church that's not what you believe in as a born again Christian. People are going to look at you and like, oh, I guess he approves of that church. There he is. A stay from all appearance of evil, the Bible says. And as I get back to where I was. Note, however, that there is no indication here that the Jewish Christians were using the idol meat, I-D-O-L, as part of their worship. But it is not okay to partake in the religious system itself because the corrupt character of the participants would be harmful for believers. Rather, we must be separate from the worldly system. 2 Corinthians 6 14 to 7 1. 
Therefore, when items, byproducts associated with pagan religious systems not only develop religious associations of their own, but have been integrated into what would otherwise be true Christian worship, as the celebration of Christmas has clearly become in our culture. It's a mix of Christianity and it's a mix of paganism that we should pull away from them so that there is no confusion over our allegiances. What is that? People in the world today think Christmas is Christian and it's not. Christians today believe Christmas is Christian and it's not. Letter C, Galatians 4, 9, and 10. Colossians 2, 16, and 17. Both these passages of Scripture refer to a Jewish holy days under Old Testament law. If Christians were not even to observe the Old Testament holy days, days that did have divine sanction for a time, they certainly don't have the liberty to observe pagan holy days. And Colossians and Galatians is Paul right into Gentile areas. Letter D. James 4.11. James is saying that Christians may only judge a brother on matters determined in God's word. Moral issue. If a matter is not covered in the word, then these are matters of Christian liberty. Romans 14, 1 through 13, and 1 Corinthians 8, 4 to 13. Listen, if, if a Christian wants to eat pig, you can't find it in, in the New Testament scriptures. For you not to do it. Matter of fact, Paul says, hey, if you can do it as well pleasing to God and thank God. If you can bow your head over pork chops and thank the Lord that, you know, you don't have a Jew sitting there. I wouldn't do it to offend a Jew. It would be poor testimony. Then again, you got people who are vegetarians. And Paul mentions, hey, there are people who don't want to eat meat. There are people who just eat, you know, grass and weeds and whatever you want to call it. That's their preference. There is no divine scripture say, thou shalt, you know, meat or vegetarian. But he who judges in the areas of Christian liberty is, in effect, judging and condemning the word of God as being imperfect standard to which the judge thereby refuses to submit. On the other hand, since we have a clear scriptural precept that condemns the things that go around December 25th. In the name of Christ, the celebration of Christmas does not appear to be a matter of liberty, but one of moral conduct. It would be like for me to say, what you and your wife do behind your bedroom wall, you can't do it. You want a chapter and verse? Well, listen, the only thing you can find in the Bible where I can judge a Christian is, that ain't your wife. <laughs> and then it's, it's adultery, fornication, or whoredom. But if that's your wife, and, and you're married to her, and it's your bedroom, you're at liberty. And you know, God gives a husband and wife great liberty. But if you're not married, there is no liberty. Uh, part 5, I believe, the right response. We're going to go through some things here, answers and, and problems that will be arise. And problems with wanting to do right. Letter A, quench not the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19-22. 
Test all things against the scripture. And John says in 1 John, try the spirits. And you know Christmas is spoken of as a spirit. The spirit of Christmas. So I will take the spirit of Christmas and match it with the Bible, which I've had, and I found it to be false. Christmas, I mean. Line up the beliefs and actions what with is true. I .e., do not treat with contempt the Word of God. If one is convinced that celebrating Christmas is a sin, then he and his family must not compromise with the world or the church by participating in any Christmas celebration. Romans 14.23 I believe Christmas is a sin. I am not going to go to any Christmas pageant, any children's Christmas thing, any Christmas cantata. There are certain things I will not do because I believe it's a sin. And that goes for smoking, drinking, or anything else. If you believe in your heart and you have scripture to show you that you're not to do it, Guess what? You're not to do it. There's no liberty. Letter B. Avoid traps of the devil. Number one, lack of zeal. One who never considers why he does certain things, but he just does them because he always has, or because his parents always has, one who acts upon emotions rather than the facts. Now Satan will tell you it's okay to do what we've been preaching against. Your mama told you. Your grandparents told you. Your pastor does it. Your church do it. Stalin is, you know, he's, he's a killjoy. He's misinterpreting the scriptures. He doesn't know the truth. And number two brings us to the lack of truth. One who does things for good reasons and right motives, you have plenty of zeal, but not in the truth. Let us see. Realizing that Christian celebration, celebrating Christmas as the day of Christ's birth makes no more sense than adding any of the following days as a special day of Christmas, uh, Christian celebration. Remember the Bible's focus on the birth of Christ is for the sole purpose of documenting the, his virgin birth, his incarnation, and the fulfillment of the, prophet, of the prophetic Messiahship. Alright? That's why the, the what we're told about Christ's birth has been recorded. To show that scripture has been fulfilled. To show you that he was born. That there was an actual event in time. But there's no date recorded. So let me come up with some holidays, shall we? You want Christmas, so I'm going to come up with some Holidays. Now, let's start celebrating, right? Number one, baptism celebration. Why not have three days of swimming parties in the summer in order to celebrate and symbolize Christ's three days in the grave? We could pick a theme based upon the speculation of when John the Baptist baptized Jesus. I think John baptized Jesus uh, on April 23rd. So on April 23rd is my celebration of baptism, and we're going to, for three days, we're going to go swim around people's swimming pools and have a man dress up like John the Baptist and eat locusts and everything like that. Hey, come on! Well, Stolly, that's far-fetched. Number two, ascension celebration. Why not have one day set aside for a year? We'll have to pick a day. For hot air balloon rides in order to celebrate Christ's ascension to heaven. We'll all go up in hot air balloons. Where your pastor's full of hot air. For having a Christmas celebration. 
<laughs> oh, I hate when you say things like that. All right. Come on, let's have a baptism celebration, ascension celebration. Number three. I guess you can call this charismatic. Miracle celebration. Let's be considerable to the Bible focus on Jesus' miracle, even more than his birth. So why not have one day set aside every year to celebrate Christ's miracle? Let's have the first miracle recorded in the Bible in John chapter 2. Why don't we have Christian wine tasting parties where the pastor takes water and changes it to wine? Let's pick a day. Oh, let's see. Marriage, let's say, when's a good? About June. Uh, let's pick an equinox. June 21st. And someone about ready to call 911 and say, I, I have a problem. And we're going to stop right there. Now, did you think those things were foolish? But they have scriptural grounds. A lot more scriptural grounds than Christmas does. And we're going to stop right there.